Welcome back to the next part of the exploit development series. In this part, we are going to bypass the depth stack protection once again, though instead of using virtual alloc like last time, we are going to use a different Windows API function called write process memory, which also allows us to bypass depth using a kinda different technique. Depending on the scenario and the circumstances, one technique might be better than the other, so it's usually a good idea to practice the various techniques available to an attacker. Taking a look at the Microsoft documentation for write process memory shows that it writes data to an area of memory in a specified process. This means that we can move our shellcode that we placed on the stack, which is marked as a non-executable area, to an area that is in fact executable. Those areas we are going to use are called code caves and will be explained in a bit. Taking a look at the prototype of write process memory shows that we have five arguments. Each process is the handle to the process we want to copy or write data to. In this scenario, the process is obviously the same as the process we are currently exploiting, which means we can set it to hex all Fs or a minus one, which just specifies that it's the same process. LP base address is the address of a code cave, which we will discuss in a bit, and this is also the return address, as we will copy our shellcode from the LP buffer address, which is the next argument, to the LP base address, and then after write process memory is finished, we will return to LP base address in order to execute our shellcode. And size can just be set to either the size of the shellcode, or it can also be larger. So if we say our shellcode will be roughly 700 bytes large, we can simply set n size to, for example, 900. LP number of bytes written is not needed in this scenario. That argument could contain a memory address that will be filled by the WPM function with the amount of bytes written. Since this argument is optional and we don't need it, we can just set it to null, which will result in the argument getting ignored by WPM. Finally, if write process memory executed successfully, it will return a non-zero value and otherwise it will return zero. For the code caves, we are going to use libspp, so the same module we are going to use for our ROP gadgets. If you don't know how to extract ROP gadgets from a module, just refer to the last video or the article on guide attacking. So a code cave is basically a memory region which is not used, so it's filled with zeros and has the executable permission set. The two permissions we need are execute and read, because in order to execute code, we obviously have to read it. And we don't need the write permissions because write process memory will actually set the write permissions to that memory region if needed, then copy or write the data. And after that process is done, it will restore the original permissions, effectively removing the write permissions if they weren't present before. Since we don't really need write permissions after our shellcode was placed there, that's perfectly fine. So how can we check for our code caves? We can take a look at the base address of libspp and just display some data here. There are a bunch of zeros here, but obviously that space won't be enough for our shellcode, so we have to enumerate through the entire module, or we have to enumerate through the module until we find a suitable code cave, and then we can use the exclamation mark vprot command and an address to display the protection settings for that memory address. In this case, it's set to page read only, so it doesn't have the execute permission set, which is required. Since this is a very tedious process, I wrote a little Python script to automate everything. That script is not yet a native WinDebug extension, but I will port it to a native one sooner or later, but for now it relies on the PyKD extension for WinDebug. For PyKD to work, we first need a Python 3 version up to 3.9. 3.10 is not supported yet, and when browsing, for example, the Python 3.7.0 site, scrolling down to the installers, we have to choose an x86 installer, so one of the bottom three ones, and not one of the x86.64 ones. After installing Python on the system, we can go to githomelab.ru slash pykd, and that site unfortunately gets kinda censored by various search engines. So for example, DuckDuckGo at the time being doesn't show that result. Google works though, so either use Google or just type in the URL directly. On the PyKD project page, we can scroll down and go to WinDebug extension to the download page. And here, just download the PyKD extension 20025.zip. After downloading that archive, you can extract the 32-bit, so the x86 version of the DLL, and then you have to go to C, 
Program Files x86, Windows Kits, 10, Debuggers, x86, and Win Extension. And there you just put in the pykd.dll file, which requires admin privileges, and after doing that, you can use the pykd extension in WinDebug. Next, we can open up our Windows terminal and use pip install pykd to install the Python module for pykd, since the script we are going to use relies on that module. If you just install Python, you either have to use the direct path to the Python binary or reboot your system, since the new path variable doesn't get used before a reboot. So after installing pykd, the requirement is already satisfied on my system, we can head over to my GitHub repository for CodeCaver and download the CodeCaver Python script. That Python script is not optimized by any means, so it's not that fast, especially since it's Python and uses pykd, etc. But it works for now, and that's fine. As I said, I will port that script to a native WinDebug extension eventually, because the Python script has some limitations. The limitations are primarily because of pykd. You can't use WinDebug Preview or newer versions of WinDebug. So when you face any problems, go to the download page for Windows SDK, which includes WinDebug, and right here you can download the most recent SDK. Scroll down a bit and go to Windows SDK and Emulator Archive instead. During testing, I confirmed that Windows 10 SDK version 1903 works fine, so just download that SDK if needed and install it. After downloading all those files and installing the modules, we can go to WinDebug and to the command window, and first of all, load pykd. If this works, we won't receive any output, and next we can use the exclamation mark py command. From here on, we can specify the path to the script. In this case, it should be users admin desktop codecaver.py. This shows the usage of CodeCaver requires you to specify a start value and end value, so we don't receive any error messages, meaning we can use Python and pykd in WinDebug. CodeCaver basically enumerates the module using exactly the two commands I demonstrated earlier and displays all potential code caves. We will display the addresses for libsvp again, take the start and end address, and then just put them as arguments to that command. Depending on the size of the module, this might take some time, up to a few minutes. So eventually CodeCaver is finished, enumerating the libspp module, and we can see that it found two code caves with 12 bytes, one with 20 bytes, and one with around 4000 bytes. If possible, we obviously want to use a code cave that has at least a couple of hundred bytes of space, since for example the shellcode for a reverse shell depending on whether you're using Metapreter or not, can be a couple of hundred bytes large. To double check the code cave, we can take the address from CodeCaver, which is 101.6701c, then use the display command to just display the content of that memory region, which shows that it's indeed all zeros. And finally, we can use the vprod command and the address, which shows that it's page execute read, so we can read from that memory region and we can execute code that is placed there. Next, we can focus on our exploit. Since write process memory unfortunately doesn't get imported by libspp, we are going to use a technique again which makes the exploit OS dependent. This means we will obtain an address from the IAT, dereference it and then add the difference between that function and write process memory, aka write process memory stub, to eventually obtain an address to WPM. Last time I showed how to obtain the IAT using IDA, this time we do the same using WinDebug, by taking the base address of libspp and first of all display the headers. Down here we can see that we have the import address table directory at offset 168.000 with a total size of 60c. There are two ways to display the IAT which are both fairly similar. First, we are going to use the dps command, the base address of libspp, and then we add the offset, which we obtained from the headers from the module. Either we just leave it at that and get back a fraction of the input address table, unless it's very, very small, or we can just copy paste this here as the second argument and add 60c to the end. So this means it should enumerate the IAT from this address to that address. Since this is going to take some time, I'll just leave it at this and hit enter. 
We can see that we got a bunch of entries from the input address table. On the left side we can see the IAT address, in the middle we can see the actual address of the function within the module it gets imported from, and on the right side we can see the symbol name. So the very first entry for example is from ADB API 32, get named security info w stub, which is located at that address in ADB API 32.dll and the IAT address of that function is 101.68.000. For that exploit, we will once again use a ROB skeleton, this time not the VA one from last time, but the WPM one, but in the end, it's the same concept. First of all, we have a dummy value where we will place some value from the input address table, which is going to be an entry from kernel32, as WPM is located in kernel32. And for this exploit, we are using the entry for get process heap, but in the end, it doesn't matter. Next, we have the return address, which is the address of the code cave we discovered earlier. If it doesn't contain a null byte or a bad character, it can just be hard coded. Then we have the hprocess argument, that is the pseudo handle to the current process, so it can be set to hex all apps, and because of that, hard coded as well. Then we have the LP base address argument, which is simply the same as the return address. Next, we have the LP buffer, which is the stack address of the shellcode, which we have to calculate later on as the offset changes while writing the ROP chain. So just place in a dummy value for now or an estimated offset. And size will simply be set to, for example, 900 while writing the ROP chain, and LP number of bytes written will be set to null. That said, we specified the ROP skeleton, we have the buffer, which will allow us to eventually trigger the buffer overflow, so we can start writing the ROP chain. First of all, we will override the return address with the first gadget of the ROP chain, which will then get loaded into the EIP or instruction pointer CPU register. Right here we have the first gadget, which will save the current stack pointer at the time being, by pushing ESP onto the stack and then popping it into ESI, and afterwards we just need 4 bytes as a filler. After saving the stack pointer, we use a few more gadgets to align that pointer with the very beginning of the ROP skeleton. This is done by moving it into EAX, as EAX is used primarily for arithmetic operations, and after doing that we need some stack alignment for the pop ESI, pop EBX, etc. Then we use a pop ebp to load the value decimal minus 36 into the ebp register. ebp then gets added to eax, effectively subtracting 36 from eax, which will align eax with the first entry of the ROP skeleton. After doing that, we exchange eax with edx to save the pointer, since eax will be used in nearly all arithmetic operations. Now we can proceed to patch the address of write process memory into the ROP skeleton. For that we use the following gadgets, which first pop the offset from get process heap to write process memory into EAX, and then negate EAX to avoid null bytes. Then we move EAX into EBP and pop the IAT address of get process heap into EAX. A uh, move EAX, the reference EAX is then used to dereference the IAT address and obtain the actual address. Add EAX EBP is used to then just add the difference to the address, essentially calculating the address of WPM. Move dereferenced EDX, which stores the pointer to the skeleton. EAX is then used to patch the address into the skeleton. Since those offsets often change when updating Windows, so with Windows updates or even patches, it's likely that you have a different one, so just go to your WinDebug, type in question mark kernel 32 get process heap stop or whatever function you're using minus kernel 32 exclamation mark write process memory stop and that will calculate and display the difference of those two functions on your system next we have some hard-coded values the return address the process handle and the code cave address so we have to increase edx 16 times aligning it with the dummy lp buffer address Simply use that gadget right here, increase edx, and paste it in 16 times. After doing so, we can patch the LP buffer argument. Of course, I already know the offset, but since this is not known during the process of writing the ROP chain, 
just place in a dummy value or an estimated one. For me, it's the actual one, minus 124, which gets popped into EAX and then negated to avoid null bytes. To calculate the offset, just place a breakpoint at the next gadget when you are done, which pushes the ESP to the stack and then pops it into ESI. And from there, just calculate the difference between that stack pointer and your shellcode. After obtaining another stack pointer, we move it into EAX and then add EBP to it, essentially aligning EAX with the shellcode in memory. Then again, the move gadget to patch the address into the skeleton. The final two arguments are fairly easy to patch into the skeleton. For n size, just increase EDX four times again to align the pointer. Then we pop minus 900 into EAX, negate it to make it positive 900, and use the move EDX EAX instruction to patch it. Same goes for the last argument, LP number of bytes written. Here we just increase EDX again, then X or EAX with itself, setting it to null, which is the value we need for the function to ignore it, and then patch it into the skeleton. After patching all the arguments, we can call the actual write process memory API function in order to bypass step. Right here we pop minus 24 into EVX and then add it to EDX in order to align the pointer again with the very beginning of the ROP skeleton. Next we move it into EAX and then use an exchange EAX ESP instruction to move the execution flow after returning from that gadget to write process memory. Finally all we have to do is add some shellcode, so for now we just add a bunch of knobs, let's say 40, and then a bunch of break instructions. So right here we add the EIP variable, the ROP variable and the shellcode variable to the buffer and that's it. We can return to Windybug and set a breakpoint at that gadget and right here we can say python wpm10026. We broke at that specified address which pops the difference of those two functions so we can see right here that dereferenced EAX contains the address to kernel32 get process heap stop. And after the add EAX EBP instruction, EAX will contain the address of WPM. Next, we can set the breakpoint at the address for the exchange instruction, so the very last gadget, and continue the execution. So we hit the exchange EAX ESP instruction, nothing in the ROP chain caused any access violations, and returning from that very last gadget moves the execution flow to write process memory stop, as you can see here. Using PT, we can continue the execution up to a return instruction in that function, which depending on who knows, can take some time. So we hit the red 14H instruction and once again can use P to step forward. We can see that we are actually now at the 101.6701C memory address, which is the code cave address discovered earlier. And if we successfully bypass step, we should now be able to execute those knob instructions without causing any access violation which in fact is the case. Now to test some actual shellcode, we place a breakpoint at kernel32 write process memory stop and resume the execution. And on our Kali machine, we can generate some shellcode using, for example, MSF random. Next, we replace the break instructions right here with the actual shellcode. And now we can say python wpm10026, which results in Windybug breaking at wpm. After stepping through wpm and the knob sled, we hit our shellcode, which unfortunately will sooner or later trigger an access violation. This is because the memory region does not have the write permission set, but the decoder stop added by MSF Venom must write to the memory region of the shellcode in order to restore the original bytes. Since this is not possible right here, we have two options to solve that problem. Either we write custom shellcode that doesn't contain any bad characters in the first place and thus doesn't require any encoding or decoding, or we write a ROP chain based decoder, which will be discussed in the next part of the exploit development series.